Today, talking about much more in 24, I'm going to share with you probably my very favorite subject. I'm going to talk about the righteousness of faith, righteousness. And so we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. This is Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul saying to us today, but if the ministry of death, whoa, that's New Testament saying that to us, written and engraved on stones. So what is written and engraved on stones that the Bible talks about? The Ten Commandments, right? Holy Spirit just called it the ministry of death. God never intended the ministry of the Ten Commandments to bring life to people. The Ten Commandments does not provide Zoe life. It does not pr produce happiness and joy and peace and righteousness. It cannot do that. That being said, Paul said to us in Romans 7, God's law is still holy, just, and perfect. But we can't keep it. We fall short because the Ten Commandments is God's perfect standard. And the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory or the standard of God. So if the ministry of death was written in the grave on stones, if it was glorious, so we know when you read Exodus, you'll find when Moses received the Ten Commandments and came down from the mountain, there was glory on him. But that glory began to fade. That glory was not permanent. So that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. There you go. It was not permanent. It was why well, he had just been in the presence of God. Verse 8. He says, How will the ministry of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation, now then he's calling the Ten Commandments, not only death, but condemnation, damnation. He said, if it had glory, look what he says now. The ministry of righteousness, right standing with God, exceeds much more, much more in glory. It's permanent. And righteousness just simply means being right with God. One of my Greek dic dictionaries declares that righteousness is being approved of and accepted by God through Jesus Christ. See, the great story of the Bible is what we refer to as the great exchange. That Jesus, the Son of God, came born of a virgin so that he would be free of the sin in his blood so he could grow and even though he was tempted in all areas as we are, he never yielded to sin. Never, never yielded to sin. So that when he went to the cross about 33 and a half years old, on that cross, he was there as the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God. And he took into his body the fiery indignation, the fiery wrath, the fiery judgment of God himself was put into Jesus' body. Not his spirit, his body. And his body was ravaged with sin, our sin. Sickness, our sickness. Poverty, our poverty. Jesus became everything that man was on the cross. All of our guilt, all of our shame, our fear, our anxiety, our panic, our poverty, everything. Jesus took it all on the cross. So that when he, at the end of his being on the cross at 3 p.m. that day, cried out in the Hebrew, kula, finished is what that word means. And I'm going to show you later on that he ended the law right there for mankind. Oh, it's so great. He ended the law. He, see, Jesus himself said, I did not come to destroy the law. That's what he said. He said, I've come to fulfill the law. Why? No one could do it. No one could keep the Ten Commandments. He did. He was the end of the law on the cross. And so now then, the New Testament tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin, that'd be Jesus, was made to be sin, that'd be God the Father made him to be sin, 
that we might be made, the King James says, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so in this great exchange, he took our sin so we could take his righteousness. So now that the glory of God could come upon our lives, the grace of God, the goodness of God, that we might now have right standing with God, the ability to be approved of him and accepted by him, not on our own works, but based on the work of the cross. But now then we're free of condemnation. We're free of spiritual death, separation from God. We're now free of lack and poverty. We're free of sickness and disease. The Bible says in Galatians 3.13, that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That we might become the blessed of God. Christ, let me read it. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He became a curse on the cross, family. He became a curse for us. Because the Bible says, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles and then we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That promise is found in Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Blessing, empowerment to prosper. It's what the word blessing means. Empowerment to succeed. And then also favor. That God's voluptuous favor. I call it voluptuous because it's so good. It's so giving. It's so freeing. We have all of that in our born again spirit when we say yes to Jesus. Jesus took that curse upon himself. So then now we can have not just some cold, hard stones to live by, but that we might have God himself coming, dear God, and taking up residence within us, living in us, not outside of us, not at bay from us, because God could not invade a person who had the sin nature living inside him. He couldn't do it in the old covenant. They still have that sin nature. When you're born again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things pass away, behold, all things have become new. Yes. And now he comes and lives within you. And now then, he can talk to us. He can walk with us. I showed you last week from Hebrews 10. He said, I'll walk with you. I'll talk with you. I'll live within you. I'll never remember your sins again. Thank God he does it. This is such a blessing that people don't really understand the import of it. That we're free from this sin nature. We're free from having to live under the guise of the enemy that's in this world, controlling this world system, the devil. We don't have to live by him. That we can live free and we can be victorious that we can walk by Holy Spirit, that we can live by His promptings. Amen. And everything He gives us, that we can talk to God individually Amen. and that He will guide our lives and direct our lives and that we can be free of the sin nature and free of the flesh and free of, of uh, worry and stress and condemnation. Folks, we are free of it. We are not to live this life that you can be free every single day. Jesus said in John 8, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. And he said, if you'll continue in my word, you'll know you'll be my disciple, my student. Then he said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you ongoingly free. Amen. Yes. And so now then, this ministry of righteousness that we have, this right standing with God free from shame and fear and guilt and, and all the, the perverseness of this world, the corruption of this world, it exceeds much more in glory. Let me read that verse from several other translations. Let me read it from the uh, Passion. For if the former ministry of condemnation was ushered in with a measure of glory, how much more does the ministry that imparts righteousness far excel in glory? The NIRV, the law that condemns people to death, had glory. How much more glory does the work of the Spirit have? His work makes people right with God. And then Amplified Classic. For if the service that condemns the ministration of doom had glory, 
how infinitely more abounding in splendor and glory must be the service that makes righteous. It makes you righteous, accepted by God. The ministry that produces and fosters righteous living and right standing with God. So again, I've already shared with you now because of Jesus becoming sin with our sin and you accept him, you're now in right standing with God. That God accepts you, loves you, blesses you. But also that righteousness should be producing a righteous living. Now, when I talk about, when the Bible talks about righteous living, he's not talking about, you know, goody, goody. That you're better than everybody else. That's not what he's talking about. See, Jesus made a very simple statement at the, at the very center, a very closing part of the Sermon on the Mount. It goes into Matthew 7. So the last verse, next to the last verse of Matthew 6, 33, tells us, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now, I know I'm, I'm being redundant. I have to be redundant. And the more I say things to you, the more I want you to get it. So I am redundant and I plead guilty. I'm going to say some of these things over and over and over, and that is this. If your spouse is first place, then God can't be. If your children are first place, God can't be. If your grandchildren are first place, then God can't be. If your ministry is first place, then God can't be. If your career, your job is first place, then God can't be. If your hobby, whatever that is, is first place, then God can't be. You need to move those things first place out of your heart and be seeking first God in his kingdom. What is the kingdom? I did a series some time ago on Wednesday nights about the kingdom of God. Y'all get it. It's on our streaming service. You can get it. It's there. Kingdom is just one word made out of two words. King's dominion. Shortened to kingdom. See, Jesus, the Bible tells us, is king of kings. Not talking about kings of the world, talking about you. The Bible says you are a holy priesthood, a chosen generation, a, pro, a royal uh, priesthood. The Bible says you are a priest and a king, Revelation 1, unto God through Jesus Christ. You're a king. Where? In your flesh? No, in your spirit. Amen. You're a king in the spirit. What does a king have among other things? Authority. So when the king speaks to his subjects, what do his subjects have to do? Obey him. So when you as a king understand your authority in Christ and you speak to demon spirits, to sickness, to disease, the same way Jesus did, they must obey you. But here's something that I've learned about being a Christian. You've got to be consistent and you've got to be persistent. You know, I told you before, I've asked Jesus thousands of times, why did you choose me to be a pastor in Odessa, Texas? He said, because you're consistent. Because you won't give up, and I won't. Amen. Have I had setbacks? Yeah. Has this church had setbacks? Yeah. But we don't give up. Right. We're going forward. We're now in the 43rd year of this church's Amen. ministry, and this is much more in 24 much more than 24. You've got to be consistent and you've got to be persistent. Why is that? Because Satan is persistent. He's very persistent. He will not give up. You have to make him bow to you in Jesus' name. So Jesus paid an awesome price so his kingdom could be foremost in our thinking, our hearts, our spirits. So Jesus, when he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he said, all these things will be added to you, the things that the world is seeking after, money, fame, whatever, that God will give you everything you need and more because he's a good God. He said in Luke 12, 32, fear not, little flock. It's my, it's God's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. Woo. 
And Paul said to us in Romans 14 that God's kingdom is not meat and drink. God's kingdom is not about your diet. Give me a break. Huh? I'd like to mess with you a little bit here. He said, no, it's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Spirit. So God's kingdom is consistent with have, having a right standing with God and then learning how to live right. It's peace. Peace with God, peace with yourself, peace with your fellow man, living in the shalom of God, welfare, health, prosperity, every kind of good. That's what the word peace means biblically. Righteousness, peace, and joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Too many Christians today live weak, undefined lives. God wants you to be strong. Amen. Paul told us in Ephesians 6.10, we're to be strong in the Lord, not in yourself, in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then he talks about putting on the whole armor of God, of which one piece of that armor is the armor the breastplate of righteousness. Now it's symbolic. You're already righteous in Christ. He's talking about living it out. Again, righteousness will give us right standing with God, but it will also produce right living. So Jesus said in that same chapter of Matthew 6, where he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, you go back to verse 9 and 10. Because in Luke, the same thing, the uh, disciples asked Jesus to teach him them to pray. Uh, it doesn't say that in Matthew, but in Luke, it does say that. So he said, pray this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Listen now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So would you agree with me today that in heaven today, God's kingdom is there and it's perfect. Yes. It's perfect. Why in God's green earth would he ask us to pray this? Because his kingdom is not being done in earth. He wants his kingdom being, now it'll never be perfect here until Jesus returns, but we can have it a whole lot better. Amen. He wants us to be praying, thy kingdom come. Your will be done. Hmm, what? See, God's kingdom is consistent with his will being done. That's right. That when Pastor Don stands up and shows you God's will and you embrace it and don't reject it, but you embrace it, you meditate, you think about it, and you begin to do it, that's God's kingdom. Amen. Because wherever Jesus is, that's where his kingdom is. That's right. And John said, greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. The Bible says in Galatians 2 that we have been crucified with Christ and we no longer live. It's Christ living in us. It's who living in us? Christ. So wherever you are, there's his kingdom. In his kingdom, it's righteousness. It's being right with God and then sharing the righteousness of God. Not per se that teaching, but in your behavior. Being kind to people. Sharing with people. Smiling at people, being generous with people. See, God loves people. God died for the whole world, Jesus did. Not just you and me, the whole world he died. And so we need to have his spirit. Jesus said to us in John 14, 12, hey, hey, the works I, he said, verily, verily, amen, amen, truly, truly. I say to you, he that believes on me, Jesus said, the works I do, shall you do also. And greater works shall you do, because I go to my Father. The greater works are numerical. There's more of us than one Jesus. And yet the Bible says at the end of the Gospel of John, that had everything Jesus had done had been recorded, that the world would not be big enough to contain all the books. Wow. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John it's just a snapshot. It is. It's just a snapshot of everything Jesus did. But it's enough we, that we can use. That we can do the works of Jesus. And then Paul said to us in Ephesians 5 that we are to imitate God. How do you imitate God? By looking at Jesus. Amen. Jesus, according to Hebrews 1.3, is the perfect representation of God our Father. So we look at Jesus and we see how he treated people. 
How he did not reject the widows and the orphans. He did not reject people who were sick and came to him. He did not reject people who were high and mighty. He taught them the truth. And in many cases, they rejected him because they didn't want to hear what he had to say. The same way people come here and they reject it, never come back. I get that. That's their decision. God still loves them. We still love them. But when you embrace it and begin to allow it to permeate your mindset, your attitude, and live it out, man, you're on your way to high living. Not without challenges. You'll have challenges. But now that righteous living, that righteousness is producing a lifestyle of you're not living a victim mentality. You're not living a defeated attitude. You're living now what Jesus referred to in the Amplified Classic Bible as the high life. He wasn't talking about Miller beer. Come on, somebody. <laughs> the high life. Got to throw something in every once in a while. Huh? The high life. Well, where's the high life? In Proverbs 18.10, the Bible says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. That word safe means held aloft. We're in the heavenly places in Christ. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 6, we're looking down on the devil. Where is the devil? He's under, he's under our feet. But you got to keep him there. Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's, this is Paul, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they be saved. Paul loved his fellow countrymen. Yeah, I bear them witness that they have a zeal or a passion for God. Man, if there's anything I want you to have, I want you to have a passion for God. When you, hey, man, 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 I'm a man. Let me talk to the males. Man, I would be so delighted as a pastor when you came into this church that when the music starts, you would lift up your hands and start worshiping God unashamedly. I'd love it if you'd start doing that. Come on, men, put down your pride. Put down your ego. Come on, let Jesus be alive. Let people see Jesus in your life. He said, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. People are still trying to impress God with their works. God's not impressed. He's not, sorry, he's not impressed. He was impressed with what Jesus did on the cross. They took the brunt of everything that's wrong with our lives. He took it into his body. That impressed God the Father. Now he's given us a life that's beyond measure. He says, for Christ, verse four, is the end of the law. I told you I'd show you that. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He fulfilled the law on the cross. He said, finished, it was done. And now you and I have the ability to come into a right relationship with God without guilt or condemnation or shame or guilt, inferiority. Come on now. What a, what a way to live. For Moses, I'm gonna close with this. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. If you do them, you're gonna live by the law. But the righteousness of faith, here we go, speaks, speaks in this way. Don't say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Here we go, here we go. Anybody watch the Cowboys? Deck, here we go, come on somebody. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But what does it say? The Word, this is what righteousness speaks. The Word, the Word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith that we preach. What is that? So back in 1986, when I was reading the newspaper one day and it talked about this new TV station coming online here in the Permian Basin, KPEJ. God spoke to me, go on television. And I said, I'll do it, I'll, I'll obey you. I'll do what you want me to do. And I said, what do you want me to call it? He said, call it the voice of faith. So what do you mean? He said, because my word says in Romans 4, 17, I call those things that be not as though they were. That's the voice of faith. Yes. Cats meow, dogs bark, horses neigh, cows moo, 
Christians call those things that be not as though they were. That is speaking the righteousness of faith every single day. You call your body healed when it's not. You call your bank account full when it's not. You call your children wise when they're not. Come on, somebody. You get in your mouth the word of God. This is, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That's the righteousness of faith. And I believe this year, 2024, that you're going to get this in your heart, get it in your mouth. You're going to become a powerhouse for God this year. You're going to be a man and woman of God that lives as the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath, that you will be blessed in the city, in the field, coming in and going out, that there will be no weapon formed against you that's going to prosper. That once and for all, you're going to put your foot down to the devil and say, no more of this. No more of this in my marriage. No more of this in my family. No more of this in my money. No more of this in my occupation. No more of this, devil. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Get out of here in Jesus' name. Do have more of it. More of it. More of it. Come on, somebody. Huh? This is the year of much more. Let's all stand. So we learned today that the righteousness of faith is found in Romans 10:8. Paul says to us, but what saith it? The word of God is near us, even in our heart and in our mouth. That is the word of faith that we preach. And so we know if you watch us reg regularly that the Bible teaches us that faith has two components. What you believe in your heart, what you say with your mouth. That is the righteousness of faith. It's a law. The Bible tells us in Romans 3, 27, that faith is a law. What's a law? Something that works every time you put it to work. So I remind you today, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. If Jesus Christ is your Lord, God loves you, he's for you, and he's on your side. I want to thank you for joining with me on the Voice of Faith today. I remind you, God loves you, we love you. Till we see you next time, God's blessings be yours. Visit donkaywood.com, an enormous source of wisdom and spiritual education from our pastor, with exclusive teaching videos, blogs, and a weekly podcast by Pastor Don and his wife, Mary, called Faith Builders. Voice of Faith is produced at Odessa Christian Faith Center, a church that is always building great lives. We are located at 9000 Andrews Highway in Odessa, Texas. Our Sunday worship services are at 9 a.m., 1045 a.m., and 1230 p.m which you can watch live at ocfc.online.church. We also worship together on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Find out more about us at ocfc.org.